positions, two opinions, two beliefs. If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. <clears throat> I, I alone am left one prophet of the Lord, one in all Israel. But Baal's priests are 450. Let two bulls be given to us. Two bulls? Yes, two bulls. Yes, 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 Make an altar to your Baal. Prepare your sacrifice, but set no fire to it. Then call on the name of your God. I will call on the name of my God. Two gods. But the one who answers by fire let him be the true God. Amen. 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 Let it be so. Let it be so. <laughs> He is a god. Perhaps he is lost in thought, or he is away on a long journey. Perhaps he's fallen asleep. Oh, call him. Come nearer to me. And I will rebuild the altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. these things at your word. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me. 
that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, Amen. are the Amen. true God. Amen. O thou who makest thine angel spirits, thou whose ministers are flaming fires, Let them now descend. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. Take all the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape you. Let them be slain. Okay, Rip, you can take it off, brother. And Elijah came to the people and said, How long? Will you waver? Will you falter? Will you halt between two opinions? Struggle, limp between two opinions. If the Lord be God, then follow him. But if Baal be God, then follow him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for the various mediums that you can work through, the way you use everything, Father, for your glory. And Lord, we ask right now that you would begin to settle in all of our hearts and allow us to hear what you had to say for us today. Sometimes things can be joyous, sometimes they can be challenging, sometimes they can be difficult for us to hear, but we know it's all your spirit, we know it's from a sense of your love for us, and even if it brings us to that sense of conviction, Lord, just allow us to hear what you're saying so we can, just as those people did in the video we just saw, know that you are the true and the living God. Thank you, Father. Just allow me to speak your words and think your thoughts and just bring forth what you have. I thank you and I praise you, Lord, in the name of the matchless and the risen Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Amen. All right. It was interesting watching some of your um, reactions to the video clip because who would have thought a cartoon could have enlisted that kind of you know response but that cartoon is done very well and a lot of times as a lot of you know who have seen me up here before certainly in Sunday school or the youth who I've um, spoken with at Courageous or even at VBS I do often use a lot of video clips uh, to make the point of what I'm saying because it illustrates it so well and that was actually the best one even though the the, you know, the actual video films of human actors, I saw that captured it um, the most. So the reason it does is because there is, let's do it this way, since this is a youth Sunday. All right, those of you, certainly my own kids, and, and those of you who have been with me either at VBS or Courageous know that one time we spoke with you about how to read a biblical narrative all right, you got the Old Testament, right? Uh, First Kings is from the Old Testament. And probably 40% of that book of the Old Testament, of the, those books, is written in a style called narratives, a story. And God did that. The Holy Spirit did that for a reason. Because narratives and stories really resonate with us. You know, and they sit, that's why Jesus taught in parables, taught in stories, because people understood it. Now, see, Jesus was a part of a generation that was auditory, you know, so he spoke the word and they heard it, right? But as time progressed, people became more of a literature type, um, learning based culture. Because people, you think about somebody 60 years ago, you know, they read the newspapers every day. They, they did a lot of reading. You didn't have to be the most educated person, but we were more of a literary culture. Whereas things have moved on, we, are, we have become a visual culture. And that's why when you see movies, they really are the, the storytellers of today. And if you see a good movie, if you see a good, even read, read a good book, 
and certainly this book, which is, which is the ultimate narrative, the Bible, you see certain elements. And some of you might remember this from school and everything, but you, you got a narrative. You got the protagonist, antagonist. It's not familiar, right? Ring some bells, right? It might bring some bad memories for some people, right? <laughs> but you got the characters, you got the setting, you got the plot and all that. The Bible is no different. Now, how many young people remember when we talked about this before? When you look for the antagonist being, he's the good guy, the bad guy. Wow, Silas. Go ahead, Josh, tell us. There you go, that's right. Good guy and a bad guy. So whether it's Jesus and Satan, whether it's Elijah, you know, antagonist, um, the prophets of Baal, protagonist, right? Whatever it is, whether it is, I mean, any good literature has that. What you got is whether it's, um, all right, let's go back to some more. Even if it's Hamlet, he has to have his Claudius, right? If it's Batman, got to have his Joker, right? You know, I mean, you can go down the whole line. James Bond, got to have his Dr. No. You know, Maxwell Smart, got to have his Siegfried. All those things are protagonists. Like that, Pastor Tony. Went, went back for you. That was for you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. But now, so David has to have his obvious Goliath, right? See, the way it works in the Bible, though, is... God sets it up the way. It says in um, 1 Corinthians 10, it says in Romans 15 that these things that were written, those things in the Old Testament that they were reading at that time and that we read now were written as examples for us, right? That's right. So now, when you're reading this, what you need to do is see who's the good guy here, who's the bad guy here. And what God does is he often will set up a situation that Unlike the movie with a good guy can just like, come on, punk, you know, and like, you know, take care of the whole thing, you know, clear the whole room and everything, and the situation is over. That doesn't happen in the Bible. He sets it up in such a way that only he can take care of this. No way David could be Goliath on his own. That's right. There's no way that Elijah can obviously take care of 450 prophets of Baal on his own. So God has to intervene so you will know it's him. The person that's the good guy, the antagonist, he's the one that's promoting God's agenda. The person that's the protagonist, that's the one that's coming against God's agenda. And when you're reading it, sometimes just look and see, where do I fit in this? Am I the one that's for God's agenda? Or am I the one that's you know, against God's agenda? Or am I like those children of Israel where he said, how long will you halt, will you waver, will you literally limp between two positions? Kind of wishy-washy, one day here, one day there and really don't stand for anything. Because that's a lot of us at times, depending on the scenario. All right, so some background to that. Because I, I, I provided that for some background that went in addition to what uh, Justin read. But Elijah is a prophet. Elijah is a prophet. The, the nation of Israel is split into two kingdoms at this point. You got Judah in the south. You got uh, Israel in the north. And Israel, who is governed by King Ahab, and his wife Jezebel, who is just trying to take over everything, they've instituted this Baal worship, this worship of a false god. And as they've done this, God has tried to communicate with Israel through prophets about what they're doing, and they just haven't been listening. So now, Elijah at this point hasn't, seen, hasn't been seen for three years. It hasn't rained for three years. So now he shows up on the scene again, and obviously, for three years, he'd been working out. That Elijah looked good. You see how he would do those pecs? My man, he was put together, you know. You know, usually you see the Elijah gray beard, oh, the Lord, you know, this guy, you know, he was ready. But um, <laughs> so he obviously been taking some voice lessons during that time, too, because he, he was blowing that last song. But anyway, <laughs> um, it does capture what it is. And <laughs> What was so amazing to me is that the first thing he does when he has to deal with this situation, because he goes to uh, Ahab, or they see him, Ahab and Obadiah see him, and he tells them, it's time for a showdown, basically. You know? And what's amazing to me is that he goes to Mount Caramel, right? And when he goes there to oh, Mount Carmel, however you want to pronounce it. <laughs> There's a big debate with uh, candy people anyway. But... If it's so fascinating to me because that mountain has now been designated by the, uh, by the prophets of Baal as the home place, the home territory for Baal. They're using it for worship. So he basically goes to their turf, right? They have home court advantage, right? So he does that, right? And as you see in that scene, 
he lets him go first, you know. Go ahead, just waste your time. Go ahead, do what you're going to do. You see him when he's saying all the things he's saying about, um, and he does say that in the word, too. They didn't include it there, but remember when he's saying, you know, where's your God? You know, maybe he's away. You know, he actually says, he also says he's in the bathroom. I mean, in the Hebrew, that's what it really means. They didn't include that in there. Because you know why? He knew it was a false God. So he was just talking trash and saying all kinds of stuff because he knew. You thought Muhammad Ali and Richard Sherman and them guys invented that stuff, right? Elijah was talking trash back then, all right? And, and that's what's so amazing is that he has such confidence when he deals with that situation. Amen. It's 450 years, so what, you know? Because this is the same God later on that's going to say to his servant, right? You know, Lord, open his eyes up so he can see what's really behind all this. Sure. And, and that's what it's really about. See, the challenging part is that when he gets up on that mountain, the first thing he says, he doesn't confront the uh, prophets of Baal first. He goes to his people, the nation of Israel, right? When he goes to the children of Israel, what, we, what I said right before I prayed from verse 21, he says, how long will you waver, will you halt, will you falter? And that word in Hebrew, it means literally limping and struggling between two opinions. And he challenges them that because if you would have taken a poll at that time of the nation of Israel and asked all those people, who do you believe in, who's your God? They would all say, we believe in the God of our fathers, you know. But their actions were saying otherwise because they were doing all kind of stuff. It's no different today. How many people, if you were to ask them in or out of church, um, you believe in God or you're a Christian? A lot of them are going to say, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course I do. I believe in the Bible. But we live in such a pluralistic society that people begin to adopt all this other stuff. I have a quote, where is it right here, from Marilyn Monroe. Any young people here know who Marilyn Monroe is? OK, all right, yeah. It's not like, go ahead, Lexus. I knew you, you know, Lexus always comes through. But Marilyn Monroe had this quote, because she was the icon of beauty in the 50s and everything. And it's interesting. She says, I believe in everything, comma, a little bit. And that statement just, that's who we are today. So we'll say, oh, yeah, I believe in the Bible. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. But I also believe in, I, I check my horoscope every day. And um, I just feel, I feel the karma is working in my life. All this kind of stuff that we add and everything. And, and, and that, um, that, that Choper guy I saw when they were having that telethon, he was really making some sense, you know. And we just kind of amalgamate all this stuff so that, we're not really representing God. Because at least the prophets of Baal were strong for Baal. They weren't wavering or faltering between any position. But the children of Israel, you're not standing for anything. And that's what he said. He challenges them. His whole ministry was about challenging them because what he's saying to them is that you can't just say you're a follower of the Lord and then make up your own rules along the way. You can't just say, sort of define how morality is going to be in your life when, if you really follow him, his word tells you what it should be. You can't just decide well, what is truth and what's not true and everything. When he tells you right here, he is the living embodiment of truth. And that's what a lot of us want to do. We want to kind of just make it up as we go along sometimes. And you wind up, that's why the church is so weak at times and, and really representing God to an unbelieving world. Because we really don't look any different than them sometimes. And they need to see something different. I'm not saying they need to see us all high and holy and all that kind of stuff and everything, but just somebody who's different than me, that's something I might want to strive for, something I might want to embrace. How is it that you are able to do this? How is it you're able to get through all this? You're no different than me. And then you can say, yes, I am, because I used to be like you. But God is in my life now, and now because of him, which is what Elijah did. When Elijah prayed that prayer, you know, they're, they're cutting themselves. And by the way, that was part of their ritual. They would go through all that. Uh, when I first showed that, that clip to um, my son, because a lot of times I'll let them be the arbiter of, uh, you know, should I be showing this or not, you know? And he said it bothered him a little bit when they showed the women, you know, do that and everything. And that's, I'm glad he was bothered by it. But the reality is that was just symbolic of the sensuality and everything that was going on in that culture. Because Baal was the fertility god. So 
God is really taking down Bill right here, because if you're really the fertility God, that's fertility for crops. That means you control the weather. So I'm going to stop it raining for three years and let's see you rain right now, fertility God. You know. But also, that translated to human fertility. And they did all kind of things um, in honoring Baal related to sexuality. So that was just a picture of it. They're cutting themselves. They're doing all kind of things. That's demonic. And Elijah steps into all this and just gives them a message. You have to, first and foremost, worship God here and know who he is. And secondly, we're going to show you how real this other God is. It's interesting because, see, for three years, it's been a drought. Mount Carmel, that, that's lush land and everything normally. It's desolate now. And when they're on that mountaintop, first of all, I mean, I, you know, that's one thing I, I meant to say. When they show these videos, they're excellent, but a lot of times they don't capture the whole scene because it would have been thousands of people there. He said, call Israel here, right? You got 400 priests going up all in their royal garb and everything, and there, there's the little um, emblems up here. Where they worship the sun and everything. And they're on top of this mountain, and all these people are probably looking down, and you got all these people here, like I said, for the showdown. And when, when he begins to challenge those prophets of Baal, they're doing that from the morning sacrifice to noon, right? You're talking about three hours there. And then he steps in and starts doing the trash talking and everything. And then after that, they do it for another three hours until 3 o'clock, the evening sacrifice. And that's why you see them just sweating and everything, and just you know, because they've been just trying to call out. But as it says, they heard no voice. They heard nothing, because he's not real. That's why. And that's when Elijah basically, y'all done now? You know. And at that point, just steps up to the plate and says a simple prayer, and God honors it and brings down the fire. See, What's so, what's so amazing is that when they prepared that altar, that altar that was destroyed um, and, and Elijah rebuilt, they, he had them doused it with water, tons of water, three times as they came. And they actually came um, with, with these big pictures and everything because Elijah wanted to make it clear, I don't have no sterno under here. There's no kind of dug handing tricks or anything like this. You know, this is the real deal. And he actually calls the people of Israel for it, you know, and... When he says that prayer and that fire comes down, that's why the, the, the other brother stands up, the Lord, is, the Lord God, he is God, because there's no way Elijah could have pulled this off. See, some, sometimes we can have a tendency to um, kind of take God for granted and take his grace and his mercy for granted. They did it. You know, God had been gracious on them for three years. And they didn't respond to that. He bought judgment with no rain. And they didn't respond to that. So they, he has to send something even more radical into their life to bring them back. There's an urgency in Elijah's message when he says, how long? Because he knows they've been just playing around. It, it's an opinion that you see often today where you look on somebody's Facebook page and, okay, um, what's the other one you said, Charity? Instagram page, and I'll bring it down a little bit. And you see somebody saying, you know, he's Lord, but a few lines over talking about something else that's not necessarily the Lord. It's two opinions. You see it when somebody has the... His word, I love him, Jesus is amazing, he did this for me, and bottom of the page, a little rainbow there. And you know what the rainbow means. And, um, and by the way, I am not saying that, therefore, we need to be hating towards anyone, but it's about God's standard. And when you try to keep redefining it, it becomes weak and it becomes limp, just like he's talking about here. When he says, how long, he's asking them in the same way that when I said when you read a narrative, you can put yourself in that position and see where you fall. God would ask us the same thing. Like, how long 
as the church, are we going to waver between these two positions and just limp through this and not have any power like Elijah demonstrated there in our walks? Because it's not even a walk if you're limping. And how long are we going to continue to go back and forth, kind of be one person maybe here, but another person out there? You know, nice family person, everything here, but get home and we're not so family oriented. You know, there are issues in the home and it's never dealt with because we're kind of faltering and limping between two opinions. Um, there are people who are in ministry, who are doing things for the Lord, but there's another part of their life that is not glorifying to God. And it doesn't mean that God can't use them, but he's saying, come back. Now, a lot of you are probably familiar with this song. This is you too, when they heard about a gospel church that was starting to sing their song. And notice the lyrics too. people are familiar with that song. Exactly. If you're a certain age group, it's hard not to be because um, when, when U2 released that in 1987, I mean, that song, that whole album, Joshua Tree, just blew up. And um, that song, in a lot of ways, was a mantra for a lot of young adults 
you know, who are quote unquote searching, still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I've heard people, and I've read stuff online when people compare to the Psalms and David and everything, and um, in some ways it's probably more Solomon-esque because it's more like Ecclesiastes. Because when he's saying that, that first part, he's talking about kissing on your lips, he's talking about what he did in the world as with women, right? That's no different than Solomon, you know, when he's tried all these things. When, when you see Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and 2, you're seeing a lot of this song. The only difference is, is that when you get to the end of Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon, in realizing all that vanity and life is a vapor, talks about serving God, your creator, in the days of your youth. See, that song never says that. And... It's so ironic because I, I was originally going to just play the, you know, the regular video with them. They walk through the Vegas Strip as they're saying it and everything. But this kind of makes the point even more. You have a gospel choir standing up and proudly singing, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And especially after they just got done saying, I believe in kingdom come, right? When all the colors were bleeding to one, bleeding as one, yes, I'm still running. They sing that part. And, you know, it's interesting what they left out the last part. Anybody know the rest of that song? It says, he broke the bounds, he loosed the chains, carried the cross of my shame. Who is that describing, right? Broke my shame, you know I believe it. And then, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And as, as stinging as that sounds, in a lot of ways, Bono there captured where a lot of us are in the kingdom, and that there are a whole lot of people, and in particular, as I'm saying this on the Youth Sunday, who know what he did, can say all the right words, give all the right answers, um, did all the VBS and all the different retreats and everything, but still haven't found what they're looking for. And it's because we're faltering between two positions, just like that song, kissing honey lips on one hand, but knowing this on the other hand. And the reason you haven't found what you're looking for is because you haven't met the true and living God. I'm not talking about going to church. See, when Elijah tells them to come back, he says, follow him because he's God. Not because my parents follow him. Not because it's the right thing to do. Not because it'll help me out and good people do this, but follow him because he's God. And if he's really God, if he's really Lord, then that's going to make all the difference because that's what Elijah was able to demonstrate there. Elijah saw 450. Really, it should have been um, around 900 because the other ones didn't even show up, the prophets of Asherah, you know. And maybe they knew the deal, I don't know, but for some reason they didn't show up. And the reality is, is that he was able to do this because he was challenging them to know the God that he knows, the God that had fed him when he was out in the wilderness all that time. The God that had just raised people from the dead, the God that demonstrated power in his life. And really what he's saying, he can demonstrate the same power in your life. Amen. You don't have to limp between these two positions. You don't have to limp through life. He called us to an abundant life. And that's, that's not that, you know, you speaking to Lexus and into existence and all that trash you hear on TV and everything. I'm talking about an abundant life where you overcome all these obstacles, where you still might have sickness, but... He's overcome all that. So he gives you a different spirit, and he might actually heal you, heal you so you can have a testimony. But it still goes back to how long are we going to waver between these two opinions? How long? Are we like the prophets of Baal where we're just cutting and scratching and going through and just knocking ourselves out, and it still is not working? Then we better do something different. It's time to turn over a new leaf, because turning over a leaf really doesn't help anyway. It's time to, to, to submit yourself to the Lord. Amen. That whole thing, well, he, he, he's God, but I don't know if he's Lord. He's my Savior, but there's nothing biblical about that, that he's, he's just uh, your Savior, but he's not Lord in your life. And that's the reality, but there's nothing in this Bible about it. Well, that's part of some doctrine. If he really is your Savior, then he needs to be Lord of your life. It's, it's just that simple. So when he says, how long, it's the same thing we would ask us. How long are we going to keep doing the same thing over and over again and not getting where we need to get? Some of us, some of us play with sin, where we kind of 
go back and forth and kind of, it hasn't, from your perspective, mastered you, but every so often it kind of calls your name and you kind of caught up into something and we just kind of go back and forth because you're not wholly given over to it where you would see others and that's the problem because you see, well, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. But you're right where the enemy wants you because you're ineffective just like Israel was for the kingdom. And that's what Elijah's saying. That's, that same spirit is here today. Just make a decision. If he's God, follow him. Amen. And once you follow him, once you stand up, you have the same boldness that Elijah had mm -hmm. to do things in your family that you probably didn't think you could do in the past because these people are going to drive me crazy. You know, but he gives you a sense of patience, a sense of forgiveness, a sense of authority. You certainly need it in a classroom because anybody who's in the classroom knows Think about the things you hear in school from other young people, right? Think about the mindsets. Think about the profanity. Think about, think about the lesbianism, all that kind of stuff. And I know we don't always say certain things like this, but this is a reality that if, if we're going to deal with it, you only can deal with it through him and his word because he's overcome all of that. So that's all I'm going to say is that how long, because it's not simply... We do it because we're in a pluralistic society, and it, that's certainly true because we don't want to offend, and everybody's, if you say the wrong thing, you know what it's about, you know. But it's also because we like to play with sin. And I had, some people were wondering why I had this up here early. I got this out of the refrigerator, by the way, you know, downstairs, so I'm not, I didn't drink it, whoever it belongs to. But <laughs> this, in comparison to this, right? Now, if you're immature, kid or something, you know, maybe not a kid at times, which one's going to look more appealing? <laughs> exactly, yeah. And everything about it, nice and bright and orange. No, no natural liquid is this color orange, you know. <laughs> orange juice does not look like that, you know. And it's done for a reason. They, they can, they, that's said it would take the same exact way without that orange in there, but they put it in there for a reason, you know. It's appealing. You open it up, okay, here's the big, you know, oh, here it's coming, you know, and the bubbles are coming up and everything, and all that, and it's tons of sugar in it. it it's so much, you got carbonic acid in it, you got all kind of things to make it more appealing. And when you put that in there, first of all, you got to add more sugar to overcome that. So when, when you finally drink this, this really doesn't quench your thirst. I mean, it has water in it, so if it's quenching at all, it's the water in there that's quenching it. But anybody knows you're really hot and sweaty or something, you drink this, you're going to feel thirsty a few minutes later, yeah. you know. Yep. But see, this doesn't really look all appealing, right? No. Well, it does to a seasoned person who knows, like, this is what I need for my body. But this, while it doesn't look like this and it doesn't sound like that and everything when I open it up, this is what we need. This is healthy for us. It's a reason the Holy Spirit is often, and when you see um, pictures of God, you see them in a refreshing way of water. Because to that culture, they, this wasn't around. So they knew that this was refreshing. We've been conditioned to think that this is refreshing, but this will leave you empty. And if you drink enough of these, it will leave you unhealthy. And just like Jesus said to the woman at the well, you know, when you drink this, yeah. you won't thirst again. Right. You drink this, you're going to thirst, and therefore... You're going to want more. This is addictive. Yeah. And you're going to, it's purposely made that way that's with right. the right amount of sugar and everything. So you will come back for more and they got you. And that's just the way sin is. That's why sometimes we're faltering between two positions because we want this when really we need this. Amen. And it's about cultivating an appetite for this. Amen. When you cultivate an appetite for this, you do it through that drinking of the water, the water of his word, you, you begin to read his word, you begin to meditate on his word, and he'll, he'll begin to show you some things. It's just, how long? <laughs> That's all i got to say is how long. It's time for a change, guys. Let's pray, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word that comes forth. We thank you for the understanding. And Lord, we ask that if there's someone here who has been convicted, 
just allow that sense of conviction to really not let them take on their own mindset, but just be drawn to you as a result of that, because that's what conviction is all about, Lord. If there's anyone offended, Lord, let them deal with it through you and your word. If they got to struggle and wrestle, just let it go to your glory, Father. Yeah. Father, I pray for everyone who's here. I pray for the young people who are here. I pray for those who don't even know you, Lord, that you would allow us to truly give ourselves over to you so that we won't limp between these two positions. And when we give ourselves over to you, and that means all of us, Father, our heart, our mind, our souls, our work, Lord, our families, our dreams, Father. Just, just take all of that and just use it for your glory. And let this be a time that Hopefully, someone will step up, just like Elijah, whether it be on their job or their family, in their school, and truly begin to represent you with that same power and that same authority. And just like he rebuilt that altar, Father, help us to rebuild the altars in our lives so we can start that devotional time with you if we've been away from that. Just as he had all those prophets killed, Father, Lord, show us once we realize you're God to kill all this stuff that's been holding us back to, from you, to cut it out of our lives once and for all and walk with you in power and authority. In your name I pray. Amen.